So this section is called the Etruscan Kings of Rome, 616 to 509 BCE. We're moving on from the idealized legendary kings to the only very slightly less legendary Etruscan kings. Who were the Etruscans? Remember back to Metius Fufetius and the Battle of the Triplets? The reason that they decided not to have an all out civil war was that there was a threat from the north from the Etruscans. They live directly north of Rome from the coast to the middle of the peninsula. And our old friend Herodotus says that the Etruscans were settlers from the Near East who colonized Italy. This was what was called orientalizing culture, which refers to when art and technology from places like Syria influenced Greek culture around the 8th century BCE, which is when Romulus is meant to have lived. Greek traders brought Eastern influenced goods like pottery and metalwork and architecture into Italy, and the Etruscans may have been a part of that immigration. There's also archaeological evidence of what is called Urnfield culture in the area around about the 9th century BCE. It's called Urnfield because they had a custom of cremating the dead and putting the ashes into urns. So yeah, urn field, field of urns. Yeah? Okay? No. All right, fine. Anyway, the story is that the Etruscan kings were Greeks who came from the Etruscan city of Tarquinii and that they were descended from a Greek named Demaratus who fled Corinth in 567 BCE and built up a trading empire in Tarquinii. In the story, it is Demaratus who brought the Greek craftsmen, engineers and traders into Italy. Archaeological evidence supports at least the timing of this, even if Demaratus himself was just added to the foundation myths in the 4th century, since there is evidence that Etruscan culture spread through to the Roman Empire around, sorry, the Roman area around the 7th century, so after Romulus. So the Etruscans were getting powerful. They had far reaching trade networks which connected them to Greece, Egypt, Phoenicia, and of course, Rome. And they had good ships and a powerful navy. It has been suggested that the reason Livy believed that Etruscan practices like lictors and Vestal Virgins were introduced by Romulus in the eighth century were because they had such a lot of trade links. So the burial practices and religion and all that were taken up by Rome. According to the foundation story, an Etruscan became the fifth king of Rome after Ancus Marcius. He ruled between 616 and 578 BCE, and his Roman name was Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, Priscus for short, but sometimes called Tarquinius or Tarquinius the Elder because there is another Tarquinius later. Yes, I know, right? Livy says he's the son of Demaratus. His Etruscan name was Lucumo, which may have meant king. So it might have been that it was mixed up with his title. And the story is that he inherited all his father's money. Remember that Demaratus had a big trade empire. So his father's money made it possible for him to be important politically, but he couldn't stand for office at home in Tarquinii because he was half Greek. Now, since Numa Pompilius, who was a Sabine, had been given the throne in Rome, Lucumo's wife Tanaquil, who was an Etruscan nobleman, noblewoman, suggested that he move to Rome and try to get some power there, because the Romans didn't care about your nationality, only your ability, and let's be honest, money. Livy says that she, quote, here's a good quote, write it down, are you ready? Here we go. Could not bear the thought of a position by marriage being inferior to her birth. Inferior to her birth. Etruscan society looked down on him because he was the son of a refugee. But remember that the Romans under Romulus gave land, power and money to refugees. So she suggests they move to Rome so that his money and ability could become power and privilege, which would give her a position by marriage which was not inferior to her birth. Livy gives us some more omens here in the story. 
In Livy 1.34, when Lucumo saw the gates of Rome, an eagle flew down and snatched his cap, flew around his head a few times, then popped it back on his head. Tanaquil, his wife, who, as Livy tells us, had experience of interpreting omens, decides it meant her husband had a chance of becoming the king of Rome because birds. Dionysius, or Dionysius also tells us this story and says that Lucumo went and had a chat with Ancus Marcius and told him he was incredibly rich. Here's a nice quote. Had more money than any man would need. Let's have that one again. Had more money than any man would need. And he basically bribed Marcius to give him to name him his heir by saying he would give much of his wealth to the Roman people. Ancus was understandably thrilled about this and gave Lucumo and his followers a courier. Remember them? Those are settlement areas, courier, settlement areas and some land for an estate. But he said Lucumo should take a Roman name, which is where Lucius, which sounds a bit like Lucumo, Tarquinius, the town he came come from, and Priscus, you tell me, I don't know. That's where the name comes from. Because here's because here's the dodgy bit. Ancus Marcius is said to have made Priscus guardian of his children. But when Marcius died, Priscus addressed the council, also called the Comitia Curiata, who were responsible for appointing the king. One version of the story says that Priscus sent the children, who weren't really children, they were young men, off on a hunting trip when the Comitia Curiae were meant to meet so they didn't get a chance to plead their own case for the kingship. Priscus argued at the Comitia Curiata that there was a precedent. That means something that happened before or preceded precedent. Numa wasn't Roman, but he became king. Priscus says he's given Rome all his adult life and, crucially, all of his fortune. And lastly, he claims that the children of Ancus Marcius were too young to be king and that Priscus would do a better job, what with being an adult and having loads of money and everything. Both our sources, uh, both our sources have slightly different points of view about Priscus's right to be king. Dionysius says that Priscus had a charitable nature and a good military record, so that was what helped him become the fifth king of Rome. Livy, on the other hand, says in 1.34 and 1.35 that it was all about ambitus, also uh, said ambitus or ambitio, which is a word used by ancient Romans to mean political corruption or bribery to gain power. Livy often thought people were ambitious. This was connected to another word you should know, which is largesse. It means giving gifts of money to people, which is exactly what Dionysius said Priscus did. Look, Ancus Marcius, I have all this money I don't need. Do you want it? Incidentally, make me king. So Livy is saying that Lucumo, aka Tarquinius Priscus, used his father's wealth to buy his way to the kingship of Rome by effectively bribing the plebeians, even though the king had children. Now, to be fair, there was no system of inherited kingship up to then. But the fact that the children were removed from Rome to make it easier is suggestive and in the end comes back to haunt Priscus when they return. There's some foreshadowing for you. So, as always, let's look at the themes here. Livy and Dionysius both suggest that Priscus was responsible for several important political initiatives. Write notes on the next bit first, okay? Then after you've made notes on all of his initiatives, you can summarize them. Now, here is a table that you can copy or print off to organize the initiatives so you can see them clearly. So either copy it or print it off but make notes on the next few slides first and then do the summary. Okay, ready? Here we go. Livy says that one of the first things that Priscus did was to extend the Senate to include 100 men from what Livy calls lesser families. There is a suggestion that one of these families was called Otavii, O-T-A-V-I-I. -I. The family which would one day give birth to the famous Caesar Octavian Augustus, who we will get to know later on, not today, 
in the Cleopatra unit. Dionysius gives the same information, but rather than saying that the families were lesser, he says they were good warriors or excellent administrators. It seems to me to be possible that these were people who helped Priscus, and Priscus might have been paying them back for their help with, by giving them political power, but I don't know. It's a thought. Priscus also built the Circus Maximus, basically a really large stadium, so that he could have really, really big festivals. You can consider connecting this to the Persian unit. Think about what sorts of building projects were people like Darius and Cyrus famous for? Is there a similar building pro project? What does building big things like the Circus Maximus do for a king's power? Livy, for example, hints that the Circus Maximus had political significance because some very favored patricians were allowed to build their own 12 foot high fori or seating areas. This would have given them status and with status comes power. The Circus Maximus also allowed for more festivals and it had things like boxing and really importantly, chariot racing. He's also said to have been responsible for initiating the construction of enormous open air sewer. It seems there were some floods which he drained from the Roman lowlands by constructing this sewer. His son finished it and it came to be called the Cloaca Maxima, which basically means giant toilet. There are actual archaeological evidence to support this. And as the Etruscans were said to be excellent engineers who had developed technology to improve sanitation in their cities, so that would improve people's health and well-being, it makes the connection to Priscus's Etruscan heritage seem to make more sense. He also extended the forum, making it larger and constructing shops and colonnades. Again, there's actual solid evidence to support this that fits the timeline, although there isn't any proof that this had anything to do with the Etruscans. Priscus's religious reforms are all to do with the Vestal Virgins. He increased their number to six and introduced harsher punishments for Vestals who broke their vows of chastity. He had to fight too. Livy and Dionysius both say that Priscus was a great military commander. There were incursions from the Sabines and the Latins, as well as his own ex-people, the Etruscans. Priscus won all these battles, which gave him new territories. There were lots of them, and Priscus brought a lot of loot and cities into the power of Rome. One of these cities was called Corniculum of the Latins. There's a legend that uh, also that Priscus was the one to first one to ride around in a golden carriage wearing purple and a laurel wreath. This would mean he was the first Roman king to celebrate a triumph, which was an Etruscan tradition. But there is one story which complicates this. Livy says that while Priscus was strengthening the walls around Rome, an army of Sabines crossed the river Anio to attack him. Priscus demanded several new centuries of soldiers, but an augur named Attus Navius stopped him by demonstrating that the gods didn't support his plan. Livy suggests that the omens didn't support this idea because Priscus wanted to name the centuries after himself, which would have been a sign of arrogance or hubris. This also suggests that the patrician families who would have supplied the new centuries opposed the king. However, Priscus went ahead and sourced more soldiers from his own people, doubling the number of men in each century, and more importantly, by adding 1,200 horsemen. This means that Priscus seems to have created Rome's first separate cavalry unit called the Supplementary Ones, and it worked because he won again. So now pause the video and summarize the initiatives I've just talked about on your table that you printed off or were, drew out earlier. Pause now. Okay, have you unpaused it? Here we go. These are the things that I got. Did you get anything I missed? A reform, the Senate has a political impact. The Circus Maximus, I got it as having social, political, and religious because you have more festivals, status. The Cloaca Maxima, I've got a social impact because of improved health and sanitation. 
and it might have had political impact if it made him look good, but um, we don't have any evidence for that, so I didn't put it down. Expanding the forum has a social impact. There's more space for people to be. Political impact makes him look powerful and religious impact, more space for the Vestal Virgins. Wars against his neighbors, more subject cities, more loot, more resources. And I didn't put military impact, but maybe military impact as well because it, he's so powerful and he wins all the time. Our first separate cavalry unit, uh, that's a definite military impact because cavalry becomes more important later. And the Vestal Virgins, obviously there's a religious impact because there's more, there's a greater number of powerful women. Um, I, I wondered about whether or not there was some kind of control element in that as well, which would have had a political impact because if he's making more Vestal Virgins, but he's punishing them more, he might have more political control. But I didn't put that one down because once again, I didn't have any proof. Okay, on a side note here, this is the statue of the Apollo of Ve, which is in Rome, in the museum in Rome. You will probably have noticed that Apollo is one of the very few Greek gods that don't have a Roman name that is different from the Greek. This suggests that Greek religion was reaching Rome as early as the 6th century BCE, which is the time we're at now. Apollo was worshipped for prophecy and medicine, amongst other things. Now, this amazing statue is terracotta, and it's by the only Etruscan artist we know by name, Vulca. And it was made sometime between 550 and 520 BCE. It's not a set work, you don't have to know it, but it's worth seeing it because it's so very old and it is authentically Etruscan. You can see that it looks different from either Roman or Greek statuary. Um, you can see that by the way that the face is shaped and, and that sort of thing. Okay, back to the story. So the omens just keep on coming. Tanaquil, Priscus's wife, interpreted an omen about a slave boy who she saw sleeping with flames around his head. When the servants went to douse the flames, she stopped them and the boy awoke unharmed. She went to Priscus and said this omen meant the slave boy was going to be important and save them later on, and they had to make the boy his son. They married him off to one of their daughters to cement his position in the family, and his name was Servius Tullius, who became later the sixth king of Rome. Typically, Livy does not believe this story. Um, in in 1.39, Livy thinks that Servius Tullius was the son of one of the generals of Corniculum. I don't know if you remember, but that was one of the Latin cities that Priscus uh, conquered earlier. When his father was killed, his mother went to live with Tanaquil in Rome as her friend. By marrying Tanaquil and Priscus's daughter Tarquinia, he cemented his position of power. There's another story that Servius was conceived when his mother was impreg impregnated by a divine phallus, which rose from a fire. But I think that seems unlikely, don't you? Right. So Priscus had ruled for 38 years, but in the background were the sons of Ancus Marcius. Remember them? He convinced the Senate that they weren't up to being kings. Well, they hadn't forgotten. There was a riot in Rome possibly started by one of the sons of Ancus Marcius. And during the fighting, Priscus got hit on the head and died. It's not known if the sons actually did the killing, but the story is clear that Priscus was assassinated and that they were behind it somehow. Tanaquil was very clever though and pretended that Priscus was just unwell. Livy says she said to him, take the throne, son, if you are man enough. In the confusion, no one was sure what happened. So she told the Senate that Priscus was going to be okay, but in the meantime, they should make Servius Tullius stand in for him as interim King Regnant until he got better. Then, once Servius Tullius was in place, she said, oh, sorry, Priscus died. That was that. Servius Tullius was king and the sons of Ancus Marcius had lost. This means that Servius Tullius was the only man up to this point in the story to have ever become king without being elected by the Senate. This story is important because it shows another step in what Livy is suggesting is the decline of the kings of Rome. Priscus effectively bought the throne and Servius stole, stole it. It's another step away from Romulus's system. Tanaquil was behind both kings' accession to power through the use 
of omens. So you can think of Tanaquil as being a kingmaker, effectively. She controls the power by controlling the king. In our next video, we will look at the reign of Servius Tullius, the sixth king of Rome.